Hi, my name is Christina. I work as a director of digital identity programs at international NGO internetbar.org and I'm here today to talk to you about seven things to make your identity solution work for marginalized populations. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. So I have been working in this NGO pro bono for the past four years and what keeps me going, you know, my passion is really to provide access to opportunities through building an infrastructure of digital identity. And what I mean is really, I've been involved with different NGOs, you know, with different international organizations like UN efforts. And what I really came to understand is that access to digital is crucial to become, you know, to becoming a functioning member of societies in many populations marginalized populations I worked with, they could not get access to the services because they could not prove who they are. And I believe that establishing a digital identity is a first step to empowering them. And, you know, we have to start talking about microfinance or other solutions only after we establish a good digital identity infrastructure. And now I want to talk about our NGO, internetbar.org. Our mission is building justice layer of the internet for all through leveraging technology and global community collaboration. So our approach is really bottom up on the ground projects based on which we draft and create um, justice layer and justice framework. Our trademark on um, the biggest project, most successful project is Paystones. That's where we create music with marginalized communities around the world. Um, for example, Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh, people living in a ghetto in Jamaica, indigenous populations in Thailand, um, and we call it a fair trade music model because we don't just create music, but we try to establish a fair trade supply chain. And it's been very innovative because, you know, how do you think about fair trade, concept of fair trade in an entirely digital supply chain, right? Another project is, for example, um, justicehub.tools, where we provide digital solutions for legal aid, where people usually excluded from legal services can access those online for much um, smaller prices. But two projects based on which I put together the list are Invisibles and Be One World. So Invisibles is a project of, for what I call digital identity for empowerment. And last year we did um, a small POC in Bangladesh where we issued medical and educational credentials in partnership with big local hospital and an, an NGO that was educating um, orphans. The idea here was really to issue credentials to the doctors so they can prove that they're doctors and also issue credentials for the volunteers um, so they can prove that they worked for that NGO when they go back to their respective um, education and institutions. And so this leads to really the trust waterfall idea that I will present later. And another project is V1 World. This is in Zambia, it's a project that started this year. It is in the educational credentials field. And the idea is really to have this entire circle where you have a high school in the US teaching um, high school kids in Zambia, teaching media arts and you know creative digital skills. And once the kids get those skills, we issue digital credentials to them. So the kids can use those digital credentials to get um, jobs, um, jobs to do some you know, online digital creation for marketing or other purposes. And so here's a list that I'm going to talk to you about today. And just a small caveat that, you know, obviously the list is based on my own experiences on the ground, but also on lengthy discussions with other organizations working on the field and number of research papers. The first point is definition of digital identity matters. Um, you may want to differentiate between identity for bureaucratic and administrative purposes and identity to empower. So you may have heard in the news of you know big organizations issuing digital identity, and usually they use that identity to manage distribution of aid, and arguably that is the first step in large-scale deployments like theirs. But when we talk about digital identity, 
we really emphasize on self-determination. We want um, communities, refugees, to use those credentials to be, again, the functioning members of the community to be able to access medical services, financial services, um, and more. And again, arguably, those kind of use cases at this point could be more useful for pilots, even though obviously we're looking to scale. The second point is paper documents get lost. I heard about an initiative where they tried to issue wristbands in the refugee camps and majority got lost in the first weeks, right? In here I have a picture of Bangladesh, you know, when it got flooded recently and environment in the refugee camps or you know other communities we work with is quite harsh. So you can't expect people to keep track of, you know, paper documents, even if it's on the paper. You know, you go into the forest, your band gets, you know, in a branch and you lose it. And another point is never assume that input documents will be complete. Well, that's why when, you know, we try issuing identity from scratch to people in those communities, we have to come up with a number of creative solutions like combining informal and formal information because formal information will most likely be lost, right? So you want to supplement it with whatever data points you can get from, the, from their family, from their um, friends, from the people they got to know, get to know in a refugee camp because they lost their family on the way coming here. And that leads to having a several level of assurance. When you have only informal information, that means a lower level of assurance, so you probably want to give access to a smaller number of services. Whereas if you have more formal information, that means higher level of assurance, or if you know, a person managed to build trust, increase the trust level, that's when you want to give more access to more services with the highest level of assurance being for financial services. And the importance of human checks, well, first of all, those people you know, they're used to harsh treatment, so you want to really explain carefully um, and thoroughly why you're collecting this information that, you know, they're not going to be exploited. You know, so you really need human checks because usually you know, offline authentication is the only way to do things, and it's a crucial chain to connect your physical self to your digital self, which is, you know, one of the important points when it comes to digital identity. The next point is carefully investigate IT infrastructure situation. Come in without any assumptions because you know some aspects would exceed your expectations and others would surprise you. In our case in Bangladesh, um, more people than we thought actually had smartphones, which was good, but less people than we thought had a stable, constant connection. Well, usually it was 3G or um, you know, people had data plans, but they ran out of them in the beginning of the month because those were really expensive. Um, that was not in Bangladesh, but I heard there are cases where you, know, you have to have ID to purchase a SIM card. So if you can't have an ID, you get excluded from the digital economy. And related to that, offline access is a must. And one aspect of it is really from a holder user perspective, where um, you know, you want to have, you want to allow people to control their identity and credentials, even if they ran out of a data plan. But this also relates to issuer, verifier, slash provider, where you can't expect them to have a large scale IDPs on the cloud, like Azure Active Directory, for example, right? So that's where you have to allow offline authentication. But then the question is, you know, how do you issue a credential based on offline authentication and most of the protocols widely used in developed world do not account for that. That's where you have to be creative again. And I wanted to highlight the importance of harmonizing your solution with local norms, you know, religious norms, cultural norms. And this is the example I heard from our conversation with a partner who did a pilot in Papua New Guinea. And that's where 
a local community leader was managing all identity papers of the community members, right? So if you came up with a question or you were trying to establish an identity, if a community leader would say that's true, it was true. If a community leader said it's wrong, it was false. So community leader was acting as an identity provider, right? And you may say that's wrong or that's authoritative, but that's how that community was establishing order and that was what how they've been operating so if you want to help them to assist them with your solution you have to adapt you have to include community leader validation in part, in some part of the flow for example and in the same community in Papua New Guinea another example I heard was where religious leaders also had a lot of influence right and also churches was where people were socializing mainly so installing solutions in the churches was very effective in having people use the solution and also people seeing the endorsement by the churches made them you know feel good of using that solution as well and i just wanted to highlight the importance of addressing gender norms because this example comes from my conversation with a person who implemented Aadhaar in India, and in some cases, men control identity papers of women, depriving women of their rights and freedom of movement, which is a parallel to the immigrants who get their identity documents controlled by the employee, employer, right? But you tend to assume that's always the case, but it's not. In other cultures or communities, Sometimes it is actually women who control all the identity documents of the family. So that's where you may want to start from educating the women if you want the families to use your solution safely. And last thing, but last but not the least, get understanding on why identity is useful is very important. And even in, you know, the developed world, we do our best to simplify UIs, make the flow as natural as possible. And in marginalized communities, you know, digital identity is something people never heard of. And even if you explain, they feel like they're not ready for it. But, you know, just some, you know, just being creative about how you present it can actually change the perception and your success rate a lot. So, for example, in Bangladesh, the user centric medical data flow was already there. And what I mean is, for example, in Japan, when you talk about patients' medical data, the assumption is that it belongs to the doctor. But in Bangladesh, it was actually already a patient who would keep a record of that person's you know, medical history by themselves on the paper. But it was a patient who would take the paper to the doctor every time, even though it was a different hospital, right? So the only thing we had to do was actually digitize that right so that was not that complicated and in zambia you know me explaining about digital identity doesn't really do the trick but you know the question we get is really how will this help our kids get jobs and if you tell them that you know this digital identity increases trust and we have a network of medium smes small medium-sized enterprises who are willing to accept those credentials and your kids are more likely to get some marketing jobs or creative jobs that's where you know you can get buy-in from the parents and i want to finish by you know the trust wonderful idea of true.id that i really really like that's where that's why we actually started with doctors and volunteers in bangladesh because you, sometimes you don't want to start directly with your target population. You may want to start with teaching doctors or teachers how to use digital identity so that doctors can teach their patients and teachers can teach their students on how to use, you know, properly without, you know, because it's a new technology we are trying to use, right? And you don't want so putting, you don't want to put their people at risk or have any privacy violations. So you start with, you know people who are being trusted and you know you go from there so you have a trust waterfall so thank you so much for listening um i want to finish up with this picture they really really like where you know i was taking selfies in bangladesh and kids were making fun of me they didn't have a smartphone but they just took a slipper and pretended they're taking a selfie using a slipper so you know having these kind of interactions is really keeps me going and i really hope that these kids would be able to get 
a good education, a good opportunity in the workforce, um, and hopefully with the help of digital identity. Thank you.